Welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here today. I'm Bill Sanders, the Dr. William D. and Nancy W. Strecker Dean of the College of Engineering. Last summer, we kicked off a new webinar entitled Faculty Insights, a 20-minute briefing. This is the fifth session in that series. In this virtual series, faculty from across the College of Engineering will share insights into their research, its impact, and provide a perspective on the future. Following each 20-minute presentations, attendees will have the opportunity to direct questions and comments to the speaker. Our speaker today is Sarun Kumar. He is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering here at Carnegie Mellon. Sarun is an assistant professor at CMU, where he heads up a laboratory for emerging wireless technologies called the YTech Lab. He designs and builds novel systems to enable faster wireless networks and new services. Sarun is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, the ACM SIGBED Early Career Researcher Award, the Google Faculty Research Award, and several Best Paper Awards. He received the George Sprouls Award for the Best PhD Thesis in Computer Science at MIT and the President of India Gold Medal at IIT Madras. Today, Sarun will be talking to us about a city-scale battery-free internet. Sarun, thank you for being here today to share your research and insights. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Bill, uh, for the very kind introduction. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my talk today is about enabling a battery-free wireless internet of things. Uh, this is my work here at Carnegie Mellon as a wireless systems researcher. So it's most fitting if I start this talk with a little bit of a, an overview of my thought process and uh, how I started working in this area. Uh, maybe I should go back right to my interview at Carnegie Mellon about five years ago now, uh, when this was, and this was the last slide of uh, my job interview at CMU as a wireless systems researcher. It's actually two scenes at the same location, St. Peter's Square, when uh, crowds throng to see the new Pope, except these two scenes are about a decade apart. And you can see the huge difference, uh, the swarm of mobile phones on the, on the right, everyone having their own devices. I mean, mobile phones are amazing. They've connected the world uh, in so many new ways uh, and are in the hands of nearly everyone uh, these days. Uh, and so about, during my interview five years ago, I thought, and I took a step back, is my job as a wireless systems researcher done? Are we done with connecting everyone? And in fact, about two or three years ago, around 2018 or so, the world had more mobile phones than people. So is wireless research at a dead end or are there new frontiers to explore? Said in a different way, what would this photo look like about a decade from now, two decades from now? And in contemplating this, I arrived at uh, my answer, which is we would now in, I mean, a few decades from now, uh, have connected billions and billions and billions of objects all around us. Um, things that you saw in that photo, like even the street, boots, watches, glasses, coffee mugs, shoes, you name it, right, keys. What does it take to connect the billions and billions of everyday objects around us uh, to the internet? And why would we even want to do that? What would that enable? And that's what my research at Carnegie Mellon ever since then has been about. It's been about two things, a challenge, which is enabling a connected uh, world with everyday objects connected to the internet and an opportunity, which is what, what kinds of smart sensing environments as well as new applications would such a network enable. And so my research over the years has touched upon various topics that have both to do with the challenge and the opportunity, topics like low power wide area networks, 5G and beyond, smarter Wi-Fi on the challenge side, as well as new applications like body tracking, health tracking, smart cities and security applications uh, that build on wireless networks. But for today's webinar, I wanna focus on two important areas that uh, uh, 
a sample of my research. First, a challenge, which is connecting a specific kind of everyday object that we have, the so-called battery-free objects to the internet. And then later I'll talk about how this enables new opportunities, just smart homes, smart buildings and beyond. So let me first clarify what I mean by battery free and battery free object. So the technology that I'm talking about is something called the RFID tag, which uh, you see a picture of on the screen here. So RFID tags might seem unfamiliar, but they're actually all around you. So it's in your passport, for example, uh, for making sure that uh, the passport can be authenticated. It's in your ID cards, corporate CMU ID card, for example. Uh, it's also in your bus passes. So here's the good, old, I know many of you here are CMU alums. So this uh, might be familiar Port Authority Connect card or you know, version of this is also integrated in the CMU ID card these days. So all of these are ID card uh, and RFID enabled. So where's the RFID here? It turns out the RFID tag is inside these cards. Uh, and these cards don't have batteries. Obviously, you don't ever remember charging your CMU ID card, I hope. Instead, it harvests wireless energy from the reader. For example, the, uh, the, the reader that you tap your card onto uh, to access the bus, for instance. So here's another example of an RFID tag, this time in another familiar object a baggage tag that's attached to your check-in luggage. And then you might wonder, why is it that we lose bags all the time, even though they're supposed to have these RFID tags enabled? So what's going on? Now, it turns out there's a fundamental problem here. RFID tags are range limited, meaning that a tag can only be detected within a small distance away from the reader. So here's an example of you know, a bunch of baggage belts uh, when you sort of deposit or collect your uh, check-in luggage. And you see a bunch of RFID readers around that are scanning the tags of different uh, suitcases to make sure that uh, you, the airline understands where they are. Now, each of these readers can only sense the tags within a small effective range, about five to 10 meters away from their location which means you can see that there are these large uh, spaces where, that are not covered where RFID tags are not tracked, which means a lot more potential for lost luggage. So in an ideal world, we would want to increase this range substantially, perhaps eightfold, so that we can, with a few different RFID readers deployed in the environment, cover a large enough space, as large as possible. So this has been uh, the topic of our work, a system called Push ID, which tries to build these extended long range batteryless RFID tags. So uh, how does it work, right? So at a very high level, Push ID doesn't try to build a new tag. It uses existing unmodified tags of which there are already billions in the world. Instead, it tries to bring cleverness to the readers. What it does is it makes all of these different readers collaborate or work together so that the tags can be detected at an extended range. So how does this work? All of these readers work together to beam wireless energy towards the RFID tag, no matter where it's located. And the cool part is they can keep doing this beams, redirecting these beams in different directions toward different tags so that you can find new tags or new pieces of luggage, no matter where they're located in this space. So to better understand uh, how this, uh, beam forming process works, we have to go back to a little bit of physics, something I'm hoping many of you are familiar with, which is this classic Young's double slit experiment. So a long time ago, Thomas Young came up with this experiment where you shine a beam of light to, through tiny slits and then onto a wall. And the effect is a pattern that looks like what you have on the right here. Bands of bright spots and dark spots. Now these bright spots are where these signal waves add up constructively, that is add up to reinforce each other. And the dark spots are where the waves cancel each other out, subtract out effectively. So that's why you have more energy in some places than others. But it turns out that's the same principle that is true for light also, true, also is true for RFID radio waves, because again, radio waves are just effectively electromagnetic waves at a different frequency. 
So when you have a whole bunch of RFID readers that are deployed in the environment and sending energy simultaneously, you get a very similar pattern, although much more complex, patterns of high energy, like the bright spots that you see here, the bright yellow spots, and patterns of dark energy, like the black spots that uh, you hear, that you see there where, where uh, energy is low. And if, it, if you're lucky, if the RFID tag happens to be in that one spot where the energy all adds up constructively, you're, you're golden, right? You can detect the tag. But of course, you, what if it was it one of those dark spots, right? Then, you're, then you're, you have a problem. So uh, here's the challenge, right? There's a chicken or egg problem here. For you to beam power exactly, you must know exactly where this RFID tag is located, right? But remember, these tags are batteryless. They don't have any energy to tell you where they're located. So it turns out for you to know the tag's location, you must beam power. So you're in this chicken or egg conundrum. What do you do now? So our approach to solve this problem is to actively model how energy is diffused through the environment by these uh, RFID readers. So what we effectively do is we beam power as before, have these patterns of energy adding up and subtracting out, and then we find some tags, and then we repeat this process, trying different patterns of energy so that we start discovering more and more tags so that these bright spots effectively move around in the space in an efficient way so that we find all the tags in the environment. Now, uh, here, one of the things to note is that when we are beaming these energy patterns, we not just find tags, we not just discover and are able to communicate with new tags, we also know how they're located, where they're located in the physical space, which is, which is a great thing. But the secret sauce is the exact way in which we apply these patterns, these, the algorithm in which we orchestrate all of these different patterns so that energy adds up uh, as desired. This is our so-called blind beamforming algorithm, uh, which finds the smallest number of such patterns that cover the entire space. I would refer you to our research paper uh, to learn more about how that works. But the end result is that we now can expand the range of RFID tags significantly, eightfold when compared to past work. Uh, and we went ahead and achieved a range of about 64 meters with uh, uh, it, with the collaboration of uh, up to eight readers. And then we could do even more with more readers and sort of the system scales uh, with uh, when deploying more and more readers in the environment. So I wanna take a step back and move to a slightly different direction that was inspired by uh, our approach, a different topic called software defined cooking. So another place where wireless energy and wireless uh, waves sort of propagating through the environment matters a lot is uh, a process called cooking, right? Within your microwave oven. So the reason your microwave oven is called a microwave oven is that it uses microwave radio waves to cook, to heat energy. So what we did here in this uh, video that you just saw is add a bunch of LED lights that harvest wireless energy and glow with, uh, uh, with the wireless energy inside a microwave oven chamber and you saw these you know these light bulbs lighting up in different I mean, interesting patterns that should remind you of something that should remind you of the patterns that you saw with the RFIDs places where the energy adds up constructively and destructively like there's high energy in some places there's low energy in some other places now when we were doing push id when we were using RFID tags adding high energy in some places was a good thing in cooking High energy in some places is a bad thing because if you've ever heated pizza and found some hot spots and some cold spots, you now know why. It's because energy adds up destructively in some places. So we said, hey, if we could redirect energy for charging RFIDs, could we do it for cooking? And that's what we did. So on the top here, you see the kinds of hot spots that are created with uh, in a traditional microwave oven chamber with or without rotating a turntable. So if you think about it, the turntable's purpose is to really smear those hot spots around. So what you see there is burnt piece of paper that really um, uh, denotes that what you're doing with the turntable is just smearing those hot spots around. You're not quite spreading the heat uniformly. Whereas our system, which is called software-defined cooking, a play on software-defined networking, 
uh, was a system that could spread the heat uniformly or into specific patterns like Mobicom, which was the conference that we submitted the, this particular research paper to. So uh, that's actually a good segue into the second part of my talk, which is to talk to you about what are the new kinds of applications that battery-free uh, objects could enable and what are some of the, uh, some of the uh, applications and opportunities that emerge from uh, battery-free environments. So uh, here's one thing that's immediately apparent. If you've ever seen those uh, readers effectively on, on either side of you as you exit uh, you know, a store like Macy's, for example, and it beeps, I hope it didn't beep for you. Um, you know how these work, right? These are effectively theft prevention uh, systems that make sure that you're not shoplifting, right? And the way they work is essentially RFID-based technology. These are just gigantic RFID readers. There's a problem though, they can only detect people entering and exiting with products. But what if these readers could now work together to monitor inventory through the entire store? That could result in smart inventory management uh, and uh, could make uh, management of products and inventory much simpler for these stores. Uh, another application which we actually deployed was uh, here's a, uh, this uh, it was the football stadium uh, in CMU where we were able to detect RFID tag uh, at RFID tags attached to players within the football field from readers that were deployed in the bleachers all the way to the side, uh, and we were still able to track the players as they move through the space. You can see the big difference in the circle of pr prior work versus our system. Uh, another application we could enable are these so-called smart fabrics. So I talked about attaching you know, one RFID tag per player, but what if you attach RFID tags on the entire uniform, right? Each of these is cost a few cents. They're actually machine washable. So why not go crazy and attach a whole bunch of these on clothing? And so what we wanted to do with this was sense gestures, just body gestures, and effectively build a sort of skeleton tracking system like you see uh, on the screen there. Now, the cool thing about this is in traditional skeleton tracking, you need to have a camera pointed at you to track your gestures. Here, you could do this with an RFID reader that's in your pocket. So it's a self-contained way of uh, tracking how you move. Why not stop uh, at joint tracking? Why not also attach this to the spine? So we can also track curvature, not just discrete angles of things like the, uh, like the arm and leg, like in traditional skeleton tracking systems. Another thing we could do, this is go all crazy, build a $1 touchscreen. I told you these cost a few cents. So imagine a surface with RFID tags that you can sort of press at different locations. And you not just know where you pressed, you also know how much depth to which the surface was pressed to build these sort of smart touchscreen uh, systems. So another example of this is a couch or pillows that could tell you when you are sleeping uh, or when my students are sleeping, right? Uh, my students also wanted to build a, you know, a demo of fat shaming carpets. And I said, that was a bad idea. So there are a whole bunch of uh, sensing applications beyond you know, the smart home context uh, that uh, we can deploy. So all of these applications are about health and smart home. But here's sort of one application that's close to my heart, a project that we are working on with uh, Bridgestone, a major tire manufacturer. And one of the problems they were interested in is today when you're driving a car, you can live have a view of the tire pressure uh, of your tires and know when you need to fill in air into your tires. But there's another process for which you don't get information, which is how much tread depth, uh, how much is the tread depth of the tire, which means you know, when your tire needs to be replaced. And it turns out the vast majority of accidents, automotive accidents uh, worldwide are tire related in some way. So if we could solve this problem, uh, we could save, save lives. So our idea was to again use RFIDs, but here in a completely different context, it turns out that most modern cars have collision radars, these collision, uh, co collision detection systems to make sure that you're a good distance apart from a neighboring car or for cruise control, for example. We wanted to reuse those radars as effectively RFID readers. And we wanted to use metallic strips uh, placed in the in in a in a uh, in a tire, as well as metallic layers that are already present inside tires, as a sort of a RFID tag, and effectively sense how much tread is left on the tire and what's the overall health of the tire, 
Uh, and the advantage of this is we could do continuous measurement. We could actually measure very, very tiny sub-millimeter changes in tread because wireless penetrates through things. It also penetrates through things like mud and things like stones, ice, things that get stuck on the tire. And it's super easy to manufacture. There's already a bunch of metal in a tire, even if you don't realize it for structural integrity. And we could sort of essentially reuse those manufacturing processes, reuse things like automotive data that are already there in, there in cars. And so this led to a system called Osprey, which was, which is currently being deployed by Bridgestone for their truck tires for tire tread sensing, for tire tread monitoring, uh, and so on. So another application that I wanted to share was uh, essentially a body sensing application, which is all the examples that I showed you so far was with an array of multiple tags. But could we do something with even just one tag uh, or a few small number of tags? And so this led to some a system we called RFID tattoo. And effectively, these are flexible tags that we built in collaboration with material scientists here at CMU. They're stretchable. They have a bunch of these RFID chips on there. They're battery-less and they're skin friendly. And one of the principles that we used here was essentially identifying something called stretch, which is how much this tag is stretched. Now, if you remember the old school antennas, if you stretch your old school TV antenna or radio antenna, it changes the frequency that you could tune to. You could pick up other TV towers by stretching a telescopic antenna. So the same principle works here with, uh, with these RFIDs. What you see there is a frequency shift as uh, an RFID tag is stretched. And it turns out it's very sensitive to the stretch. Even like a tiny millimeter of stretch is an eight megahertz shift, which is a lot of radio stations. Right? If you know how, how far apart radio stations are, uh, are uh, transmitting. So we wanted to use these for a completely different application, which is for helping users with voice disabilities, users who know how to speak, who know how to make the lip movements associated with, speak, with speech, but have lost their voice. Uh, and so we uh, built a system called uh, RFID tattoos, which is effectively attaching RF these tattoos to the face that can be sort of hidden under makeup. Here it's not uh, to show you uh, effectively, what are the speech patterns that you can make, identify what the user is trying to say, even if they don't uh, produce the voice in fusion with natural language processing algorithms. So I want to close with one final application that's uh, even closer to my heart uh, with, with, and also close to anyone from Pittsburgh because, you know, Pittsburgh is the city of bridges. So one, I've talked talk to you about a lot of different shape sensing applications on the face, on body track, for body tracking, for tires. But there's one place where shape sensing is crucial, which is for bridges. And you know, you all know Pittsburgh is a city of bridges. And also the statistic that one in four US highway bridges are in, are in need of serious repair and inspections of any kind are, are extremely costly. So we, we said, hey, RFID tags are a few cents each. Can we just deploy as many of them as needed on a bridge and passively sense its health over time? So we actually went ahead and deployed this in the, on the 10th Street Bridge, which is one of the long uh, suspension bridges uh, in Pittsburgh, 388 meters long. Uh, it was recently renovated and surveyed, so we had good ground truth information. And we this is sort of the measurement. The red line here is the measurement of uh, what we observed uh, as the shape of the bridge. And it lined up very closely with those recent schematics of the bridge, which shows the potential for ultra cheap monitoring and structural health monitoring of buildings, bridges, and so on. So hopefully I've convinced you that wireless research has a long way to go. We've connected 7 billion phones and devices to the internet, but there are plenty of tens of billions more to go with the internet of things revolution. Uh, and hopefully I've shown you that there's a vast potential for how IoT can revolutionize health, city monitoring, safety applications, uh, as well as uh, the industry overall. And also I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for having me. Sorin, thank you very much for this presentation. This is fascinating. Uh, and I love uh, the real world application of your research and how this will affect all of our, our lives in the next, uh, next 10 years or so, as you mentioned at the top of your presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us here today. My name is Gina Henry, and I'm the Associate Dean for Advancement for the College of Engineering. And I'm going to be helping Swaroon uh, moderate the uh, Q&A session here this afternoon. So I'd like to remind everyone, if you do have a question for Swaroon, 
please uh, drop that into the Q&A box. You'll see a little icon down at the probably the bottom right of your screen. So please just drop that in there and then we'll answer all the questions that we can get to today, as many as we can get to. So we've already had a couple questions come in, Swarun. The first one is about um, the similarities between the RFID tracking that your lab is doing and, and the similarities between that and phased array radar. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of what we do builds off phased array radar. In fact, some of the automotive radars that I mentioned to you later, but Bridgestone is effectively, the automotive radar is a phased array radar. So uh, the radar itself is not what where our innovation lies. It's more in the processing algorithms. So just to give you a, some perspective, right? An automotive collision radar, for example, doesn't need sub millimeter accuracy. You're just trying to do cruise control, even if you're off by centimeters that's fine and that's the resolution that you normally expect. But going from centimeters to millimeters will require super resolution, will require advanced algorithms to make the processing more precise, as well as dealing with confounding factors like mud on a tire. How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and there's, there are similar problems that, that occur in the RFID realm, right? Again, phased array radars have, uh, assume that you have this one sort of radio with a lot of different antennas, but now if you have distributed antennas that all need to be, they all need to work together to behave like one big phased array radar system, then you have a lot of synchronization issues. You have a sort of lots of complexity. So I'm hoping whoever asked the question, they know their stuff. So they understand what, I, what I'm saying here, right? So it's really, uh, it really builds, like we are all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We are, we are building on top of things like phased array radars that exist, but there are new contexts that emerge in the IoT ecosystem that we now need to deal with. Great, the questions are pouring in now. Thanks to everyone who's, who is submitting questions. So the next question is, uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is for turning research applications into products? And I know you sort of hinted at some of this early on in the presentation. So what are we, what are we gonna be facing in the next few years? Yeah, so there are plenty of uh, new challenges and there are plenty of new opportunities for research to product, but I'm going to be very honest because I have been, I've dabbled in startups before, I've collaborated with industry, and there is a big disconnect, right, between what we do as researchers and what fits in products. Because there's something you need to think about, which is the customers, right? What do customers actually try, care about? Is the market ready and things of that nature? Uh, so I've, I've always been super careful about those, uh, those connections. Some places, like for example, tires, uh, uh, where we work with industry partners, we know this is a problem. We know that uh, you know there are particularly some high value sectors like truck trucking companies where they spend like most of their budget goes into tires for some reason. Uh, we know that this matters a lot for them because this uh, in, for the company this uh, allows them to sell more tires. For the trucking company, it allows them to ensure more safety, uh, meet more safety requirements, and so it's sort of a win-win. So there are lots of opportunities where like this where some of the emerging ideas in IoT would uh, uh, can make a big splash, but it's all sort of individual case by case basis on finding identifying those right problems where where uh, the innovation that we've developed sort of fits the market. Uh, and so, if any of you have some ideas, I, I would love to uh, love love to share it because we all are looking for the next <laughs> for the next billion dollar idea, right? That's great. Spoiler alert: I'm not a billionaire yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is, you know, as we're thinking about all these RFID tags being and sensors being around everywhere and beginning to be integrated into everything that we're doing, is there enough raw materials uh, for this or are we going to run into an issue there? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I know there are shortages and chips and other, th other things that are being, uh, I know we're talking in that context. RFID tags, though, I'm not concerned. There are actually already billions of RFID tags today in the world. They're, um, I mean, they're extremely tiny chips. Um, they act, you'd be surprised, but some of the materials that we use are fairly diverse. We can print RFID tags onto cloth. We can print it onto things like special tattoo polymers, plastics within like uh, silicon based materials and all sorts of platforms. So the substrates on RFIDs can be fairly diverse, sort of conductors we can use for RFIDs are fairly diverse. 
In fact, we're working with material scientists for some of these new applications and use cases for the kinds of materials we print them onto. There are people who are working on biodegradable RFID tags, uh, not me, but my, some of my collaborators. So uh, I don't think there would be a challenge for RFID tags per se, but I do worry about e-waste uh, you know, in general and RFID tags in particular and some of the biodegradable uh, and biocompatible sort of uh, RFID technology could, put, could potentially serve as an answer to that problem. That's good. You know, the question was about the first part of the stream and, and you know, looking at the end of the stream is also important as well. Yep. Uh, the next question is around um, if you if you can speak at all to the long term exposure to RF and, and the effects on human health. So if, as more of these um, RFID tags become integrated into our everyday lives. So there is no absolutely no concern about non ionizing RF radiation, which is most of uh, uh, I mean, actually all of communication radio technology that we use today from 5G to 4G to 3G to 2G, all, all of those. Uh, the FCC as well as FDA have limits on how much RF, ex RF uh, exposure uh, a person must be subjected to as well as devices are allowed to emit. And these are usually orders of magnitude lower than what is, uh, uh, than, you know, than what can potentially even harm you. So there is absolutely no concern about RF on our health. And in fact, there are plenty of limits and certifications and bureaucracy <laughs> that we need to go through before our radios are certified. Uh, and, and, and in fact, wireless radios of any sort are, are certified. There is no evidence to suggest, uh, medical evidence to suggest that uh, RF exposure has long-term impact on health. Thank you. Uh, and you're getting a lot of compliments in the, in the Q&A session about how wonderful this presentation is. Oh, uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, have you ever had a chance to explore uh, the, the, uh, some applications that might lead to um, better energy emissions monitoring and how that might inform decisions to reduce carbon? Yeah, there, um, so there are, uh, so if, if you look at energy monitoring, for instance, it requires a lot of sensors. Right. It requires distributed sensors also in remote areas, for example, uh, in, you know, solar farm in the desert, uh, as well as like the sort of devices and also distributed sensing devices, particularly a lot of renewables are essentially scattered over large areas uh, with in remote in and also in remote locations and we need new technologies to connect to those because we can't imagine deploying one cellular tower for every for every source of renewable energy, right? Also, another challenge that's happening is that uh, uh, we have rooftop solar and rooftop renewables, things of that nature. So our electricity grid is changing substantially. And so we now need to move to a new grid model where we have lots of distributed sensors that try to understand how energy is being used. And we need new communication technologies as a result. And this is very much the IoT context because we need devices that can be cheap, can be scattered around, that can be potentially far away, range matters, far away from the closest tower. And so I work on this broader, I mean, my career award that was mentioned, right, was brought up this broader effort called low powered wide area networking, which is having these really low power sensors in the middle of nowhere, still being able to talk to, to things like cell towers. And how could you, we, we are doing things from ranging from, uh, you know, device in the middle of nowhere to microsatellite launched in space that is like million, that is like miles and miles away. And what are the ways to to uh, to build new communication technologies for that? So it's a very relevant problem for energy monitoring. Great, thank you. Uh, another question is a, a topic that we talk a lot about at CMU, and that is security. So is there a way that you can ensure that this system can't be used for? reading credit cards when they shouldn't be or other sorts of, of security concerns? So I, I, that's very funny because I um, we wrote a paper about how you could potentially use this to read credit cards and what are the ways to deal with that uh, as, a, as a resulting problem, right? So that aside though, uh, it's important to build IoT systems keeping in mind some of the security holes that can be, that can be uh, uh, that can be created. It's extremely challenging to build systems that are both secure and low power because you can't assume that the adversary is low power, right? Whoever is trying to attack the system might have access to more power, more communication bandwidth, uh, more computation, everything. So security with in, in the IoT context is extremely challenging. 
So I speak, I work with the Scilab IoT initiative where we are trying to uh, secure industrial IoT systems, for example. And one of the one of the biggest concerns that I always get when trying to convince uh, industrial IoT cust customers to move to wireless, obviously the advantages are obvious, right? You can move your equipment around. If you have robot robots moving around, you can't connect them to, a, to wires and so on, right? But the, the big concern obviously is security, right? Oh, it's wireless. What if it gets stabbed? What if it gets hacked and so on? Right, so we need to address this problem because it is it is slowing down our progress as far as industrial IoT is is concerned, and there are ways in which we are dealing with this problem. Privacy is another concern, right? You know, with all the sensors on your body everywhere, uh, how do you? What are what are the privacy challenges? You know, is your information sort of going to be broadcasted to the world? Uh, we deal with uh, that to some degree by having using edge computing, trying to build systems that are mostly local and constrained. But this again is an open research problem. At least uh, for my good karma, I advise, advise one student whose research topic, whose PhD is around IoT privacy. So, so for all the stuff that I'm doing, I also have one student to, to neutralize that and, and deal with the privacy concerns of my own work and other, other uh, research in this space. That's good. I think it'll, it's a problem that'll keep us busy for a while. <laughs> Uh, the next question is on the durability of the RFID tags themselves. So you gave an example of uh, using this in a bridge. Uh, it, how long could we expect an RFID tag to last in Pittsburgh's winters and summers and traffic and rain and all that stuff? Oh, excellent question. So as I said before, right, RFID tags are just the chip and an antenna, right? They could be manufactured on any sort of substrate. So there are actually RFIDs for all sorts of specialized applications. I mean, even something like, like tires that I mentioned, tires can get extremely hot, like more than uh, uh, you know, a, a hundred degrees Celsius sometimes, right? And you do the abrasion and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so it's quite uh, important to build systems that are resilient to very high temperature, to high, uh, to very adverse conditions like abrasion, friction, and so on and so forth. And turns out material scientists have addressed this problem. Like I so said, I don't need to. Right, building building substrates, smarter substrates are highly resilient. So we we are sending rockets these days, uh, and a lot of these materials are extremely cheap. The like compounds of rubber, for example, right, uh, or special polymers that are particularly of plastic that are particularly resilient to uh, to abrasion, to high heat. So we could potentially reuse those, reuse the innovation from our material scientist friends uh, to uh, build to use those as substrates. So the RFID tag is sort of protected and shielded. So uh, one of my collaborators, for example, built this, these smart traffic dots, right? Which are effectively inside those, uh, the, it's literally on the streets. So effectively cars trample them over and over again. And it still works because you know it's shielded, right? It, it is a chip, but it's sort of properly shielded so that you don't have to worry about uh, you know, physical security of the, of, of, the, of the tag. That's great. I think I know that research you're talking about. That's, that's fascinating. Um, so the next question is around the the beams so would it be possible for the system to use one sweeping beam uh sensing beam from one place instead of using multiple sensing beams from multiple places uh it's possible but the advantages would be limited because if you have one beam right you are still limited by the power by the transmitted energy of this one source Whereas if you have multiple beams, you are effectively benefiting from more energy, more energy in and therefore more energy out. Uh, and in fact, even if they, even if the amount, uh, there are also theories to say, even if the amount of energy of the whole system is not increased, even if the, if you take the energy budget and subdivide it, give half to one source and half to the other, if you can engineer them to add up coherently, add up constructively, like how I showed you in the, in the, in the Thomas Young experiment, so if you think about it in the Thomas Young experiment, right? There's a, there's a, there's this uh, you know beam of light from the torch, right? That goes in uh, goes on to the screen. Uh, the amount of energy is the system is not changing, but it's just that energy gets focused instead of diffusing through the entire screen. It gets focused in some places and not in other places. So imagine if you could keep focusing, keep focusing, keep focusing, almost like a lens, right? So that all the energy is sort of compacted in this one space, right? That is the effect that we could get with multiple transmitters. Right, and that's actually the, the the real secret sauce. It's very hard to get that with a single transmitter, right? Or you, you could, unless you have this slit or some of these other things helping you, which is a different research area, and and harder to get in the out of space. 
Great, thank you. Uh, next question is about the uh, processing power. Can you talk a little bit about the processing power, the architecture that's needed to accomplish this process that you're talking about with the sensing of the tags? Uh, in terms of uh, the raw sensing applications, it's it's not very much processing needed because effectively they're all like linear operations or very small matrix operations, right? Uh, or very simple optimization problems that if you if you sort of look under the hood in terms of form of our beam forming processes. Another thing to keep in keep in mind is that we're very mindful of the energy constraints of the devices. Uh, some of our optimization problems are really happening at the at at whoever is sending the beam, and that is not a low power device. That is a high energy device. We are actually not modifying the tags in for the most part in most of these applications. So we can afford to use a little more compute, right, on, on the readers. That said, there are some of my colleagues like Brandon Lucia, for example, and, and others who focus on, okay, what if I want to do all the compute computing uh, locally on the device itself? So a very classic a, a application domain where this matters, for example, is microsatellites, uh, which I which I mentioned towards the end, right, in the QA. Like where we are now launching a satellite, or only some of these small satellites from CMU, where I have a communication budget of like, you know, 10, 100 bytes per day, right? That's like nothing. And uh, we have tiny amount of compute, tiny amount of storage, tiny amount of everything, simple sensors. And we need to figure out how to get something useful to the ground from these, from these things that are deployed. And so then, then you're in crazy territory, right? Like lots of constraints. Uh, and I, I wish I had a neat solution to that problem, but I don't, we, we're still working on it. Well, you're inspiring our audience today to think about a lot of potential applications for this research. So one of the questions that came in asks if the, the, if the tags could be distributed in, in disaster situations, such as if you have a high, a high rise building so that you have emergency responders, could the emergency responders wear transmitters so that they can be tracked and these sorts of things. So have you encountered any sort of real world applications similar to that? Yeah, this is a, this is very interesting. So I, I, I cannot claim to have thought of all the possible applications for this system. So I always hear something new. Thank you for this one. Um, we've, uh, you know, some of my collaborators and I have looked at first responder tracking systems in other contexts, like, you know, you know, beacons, uh, particularly for firefighters when sort of moving into new environments, they need to have robust for fire sensitive beacons for tracking. But this also is a very challenging problem because things like smoke, debris, influences everything, including wireless signals to some extent. And also, what if everything burns up, right? What if your tag burns up? There's, a, there's very little you can do. So how do you build heat resistant solutions? Uh, so one of my collaborators, Anthony Rowe, built this sort of smart sort of fire hose, literally. <laughs> it was a smart fire hose that, uh, that you know, tells you which way to move to get back to, to, uh, to the fire truck. So the, in, uh, some of my collaborators have explored this space extensively, uh, but I agree here, right? We have only scratched the surface because it's a very important problem space and very challenging at the same time. So uh, we had a we have uh, people also thinking about how you might uh, interrupt the system that you that you've presented. And someone asked, "Can I put up? Could I just put up an ISM transmitter with noise modulation to jam such devices?" Uh, you could. Uh, in, 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 in yes, you're right. Right. In fact, jamming is a problem in almost any frequency. If you hate your neighbor, you can you could potentially. <laughs> I don't. I, I wonder if there's a law against that. I have to. I have to check. Please uh, don't. Uh, please uh, don't uh, take my advice. Right. You. You know. But you could, in principle, right, jam ISM band and make sure that you can't use home Wi-Fi and nobody else can. Um, it becomes harder to do this, and it, it's not harder. It's illegal to do this in other frequencies like licensed spectrum. Like for example, if you interrupt nine one one calls by having a radio jammer, that is that is illegal. Uh, so it's. Uh, uh, you know, there aren't clear laws against this. So some of the IoT technologies do operate in license bands, for example, things like NB IoT. Some RFID technologies do operate in license bands. So you would be breaking the law by using, by using a jammer. Uh, in other bands, you would not be breaking the law per se, but I, to my knowledge, right, I'm not an expert on the, on the legal system. I'm not a lawyer. Right? Don't, don't quote me, right? But you, um, you could uh, cause problems to your own Wi-Fi, right? Uh, so we are, in building privacy solutions, 
we usually go in a different direction, like selective smart jamming, like not jamming everything, but being smart about the jamming that you do. Or, you know, the simplest thing is get an RFID wallet, put your credit card inside an RFID wallet and you should be fine. <laughs> right, I've been looking at those recently. <laughs> A good idea. Um, so next question is about the um, the spectrums and the and the and the uh, um, how crowded they are. So many wireless frequency spectrums are already very crowded. Can the proliferation of RFID systems also po pose a risk of being overcrowded? Okay, I'm, I'm getting wonderful questions today because we actually got a, a one million dollar NSF grant that I lead at CMU just like a, six months ago on this topic, right? Which is spectrum pollution, spectrum monitoring using uh, uh, using like swarms of low power sensors. And we actually flipped what you said. So it turns out that you are right, like, you know, deploying a large number of these tags and devices could cause pollution to the spectrum. In terms of bandwidth, it's actually not very much. It's actually very little, they're all sending very little data, but just that there are so many of them and they're hard to keep track, they're hard to turn off. Right, if something bad happens, which is which is the issue here. So we actually flipped this and said, hey, we're going to deploy a whole bunch of these devices anyway. So why don't we make some of them our friends? Like, why don't we make some of them sort of monitor and see if everything is kosher, if like transmissions uh, are not leaking anywhere, if, you know, who are the bad devices, if any, who are, you know, misbehaving and transmitting more energy than needed and blocking the system and causing interference for everybody else and send this information upstream. And so can we turn IoT into our friend for spectrum monitoring and spectrum management was, was sort of the theme of that, uh, of that research, right? Because there's absolutely no way in which we can stop IoT. It's already happening, right? no, whether we like it or not. Can we instead you know, you know, look ahead and foresee the problem that you, you are aware of clearly, right? Uh, and make some of these devices our friend in that, in that process, in that monitoring and enforcement process. So yeah, great question. There's a lot of great questions coming in. Um, the next one is besides RFID, are there other emerging technologies for battery-free objects? Uh, there are, you know, there are other, I mean, NFC, for example, is sort of RFID's twin. So if you've ever heard, I mean, I'm sure you, many of you have heard of NFC, right? So um, they're just effectively like RFID, but they use near field coupling as opposed to far field that a lot of RFID tags use. There are a whole range of energy harvesting protocols in general uh, that harvest energy at different frequency bands, uh, even visible light based communication frequency bands, acoustic energy harvesting uh, standards and technologies uh, that use sound, right? So there are, I mean, any, I mean, we've actually had uh, uh, even crazier examples of energy harvesting that uses mechanic movement, right? Mechanical movement or temperature gradients, for example, for, for harvesting energy or you know, tidal, you know, tide differences in water level and so on and so forth, right? So there are a whole bunch of standards that are usually guided by the application. For the most part, uh, RFID uh, just works, right? Which is why you see, the, you see this proliferation of it in, in the IoT context if you are talking about battery-less. But when you come to specialized applications like underwater, for example, you know, RF does, just doesn't work and you need new solutions. And you have a lot of you know coastline monitoring uh, so solutions needed, for example. So it's not a, it's not a small problem again. It's not a niche problem. So there's uh, uh, you know there are other standards too. I, mean, I just focused on RFID because it's it's just the most you know out there, right? It was the most uh, popular one out there. That's great. Thank you. So we've gotten a lot of questions, uh, a lot of different variations of questions in the chat on both health and privacy. And so I know you've addressed both of those topics, but one specific one is about the um, necessary beam energy. What is that? Uh, what is the necessary beam energy for RFID activation in areas where people will be exposed? And if there's anything else that you want to address, because I know we're running short on time now, in terms of health concerns that we should have or we should be thinking about, at, or also um, any privacy or security last words? Sure. So I, I'll address both health and privacy because I know, I, I also know I scared you all with the microwave oven one. <laughs> so so I mean, I realized yeah. this, is a, this is like a killer combination. Like <laughs> microwave oven and RFID. Now I'm going to roast RFIDs. So, but just to tell you, right, 
there is a order of one followed by at least four or five zeros, right? In terms of power between these two, right? Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we have, you know, since the 1900s and 1800s been swamped in this RF soup with radio towers and so on and so forth. So, uh, and so the amount of energy that we've been swamped in, like generations of us have been swamped in is quite, quite enormous, right? If you think about it. And, uh, but it, cumulatively, it hasn't, it hasn't made a huge difference. Uh, you know, in terms of empirical evidence, right? Uh, and researchers have done double blind sort of studies, the same sorts of studies they do in other contexts to see and to you know, try and repeatedly show if there's even the tiniest influence of RF energy on, on health and there hasn't been. The other thing to keep in mind is that the actual level of power that's required for things like RFIDs, as well as things like 5G, for example, and I know there's a lot of concern around 5G, is actually orders of magnitude lower than 2G. So you should be complaining about 2G, you should not be complaining about 5G, because 5G actually requires less power than 2G. Some of the low power systems, because they're low power, actually require even less power than some of the high power systems that, that we use. So the, the trend in terms of wireless technologies these days has been try and do more with less power. And there's a good reason for that. There's an economic reason, right? If I am sending more power on the air, I'm also spending more money. I'm paying more electricity. So I actually have the incentive to try and serve more people by using less power, right? So it, it, it's funny because the, the general public has sort of gone into this trend of, oh my God, there's more energy out there, but the industry is actually the opposite way. They're trying to make profit by sending less energy out. So if at all, this is a, this is a point in history where you have to be the least concerned about ambient RF energy. It's just something I wanna, I wanna point out. Another uh, concern about, uh, the concern about privacy, right? Uh, I completely agree that it's very easy to build IoT systems that, uh, that uh, can violate privacy. And the more sensors we have, the more things that we are, we are recording, the more things that could be exchanged. Uh, so it's important to build our systems to be private from the ground up. So I'm a technologist, right? I think about what are the new sort of sensing modalities? What, what can we do? In, what are the interesting things that we can do with RF waves and, and so on, right? But I need to work with privacy experts and scientists Right? Who, you know, Jason Hong, for example, at CNU, who works exclusively on privacy, and we both co advise a student that I mentioned earlier, who's my good karma student. Right? And we uh, try and address these ways in which we can build systems where, where privacy is sort of like by default. For example, if I'm building an onboarding tracking system, how do I make it so that I don't need the cloud? I don't need to send this data to anybody else. Computation can happen locally, the results can be observed locally, and I don't need to send the data out. So somehow we have this tendency that, okay, if we need to have IoT, we need to give up privacy. If we need to have technology of any sort, we need to give up privacy. That is not true. It's possible for us with advances like edge computing, it's possible for us to marry privacy and technology, benefit from technology and at the same time, not have any concerns about privacy, but it requires very careful in, in engineering. And a lot of researchers, not just me, a lot of other researchers in Scilab and ECE and CS, in other places are, are, are engaged in. So it's an absolutely important problem, but it's not an impossible one, is, is, is what I wanna, is I wanna, uh, is what I wanna highlight in closing. Great, thank you so much. So I think we are bumping up against the end of our time. I just wanna thank you, Swaroon, so much for this excellent uh, presentation. And thank you to everyone in the audience who has put in so many um, really good questions. So we really appreciate everyone uh, attending with us here today and, um, Swarin, thank you as well for answering all those great, great questions. Uh, we will, uh, this, this program, as you know, is being recorded. So we will have this recording um, that you can watch again. Uh, and if you have any follow-up questions that we didn't get a chance to answer today or that you would like to ask, please just um, reach out to us and we will do our best to attempt to answer those. We hope to have more of these faculty insight uh, series um, later on in the year. So stay tuned and watch your email inbox for uh, the next invitation featuring one of our faculty members at, at Carnegie Mellon University. Thanks again for joining us and uh, bye everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for the great questions. And thank you for the invitation, Tina and, and team.